All right, everybody, welcome to our behavior and training lecture this evening, Enrichment for Your Pets. My name is Amelia Curtis, and I am the Education Manager here at San Diego Humane Society. I oversee all of our on-site programs. Um, I know that this isn't a technical on-site program, but it is our virtual lecture series, um, and it's been a lot of fun having um, all of these topics virtual for everyone to enjoy and learn about. Um, so uh, I have a few uh, just quick housekeeping um, details to go over and some announcements about programs coming up. And then our wonderful Juliet Nash will take over with our uh, topic for this evening, Enrichment for Your Pets. So um, housekeeping wise, we are recording this and we will send it out to everybody who has registered uh, for the lecture this evening. We'll also include in your email um, a PDF of the slides um, and any links or resources that Juliet would like um, included for you as well. Um, if you would like to have your video on, you're welcome to do that. That's up to you guys. Um, feel free to relax and, and enjoy um, in the comfort of your home. Uh, please have your, your volume on um, your microphone on mute though. Um, during the presentation, we're gonna go ahead and take questions at the end. So if you have a question, um, once we open it up, you can either unmute yourself and um, talk over the microphone or video chat, um, or you can put it, type it into the chat. Um, if you think of questions during the presentation, you can send them privately to me in the chat. There is an option to choose who you send it to. Um, so it's community engagement, I believe is how it will pop up. And I'll go ahead and write those down and we'll um, notify Juliet what those questions are at the end. Um, you can also use the chat to tell stories or um, make comments as well. So we um, hope you feel like you have some opportunities to engage through that if you like. Um, and then I wanted to show you, I hope everyone can see my screen, uh, some events that we have coming up here at San Diego Humane Society. If you go to our website, sdhumane.org slash events and scroll to the bottom, um, so this is what the page looks like. And if you scroll down, there's a whole section for community engagement events. And we have a lot of really fun things um, coming up on the horizon. Um, so just a couple to um, point out to you guys, we have an in-person event. Um, so this is not virtual, it's gonna be in-person. Um, Nason's Beer Hall's Doggy Draft, and it's an adoption event. Um, so it's on November 14th, if you'd like to um, attend that. Um, and then we have our pet talk. Um, we have disaster preparedness, um, which is the next one coming up on November 19th that will be virtual. And that's gonna um, walk you through how to prepare uh, for your own pet, as well as um, some of the ways our humane law enforcement team has responded to disaster uh, response within the country and within um, California and San Diego. Um, we have our Wake Up With Wildlife, which will be on December 5th, um, and that one is going to be case reports from the hospital. So it will go over some of the typical cases that we get in our wildlife hospital, as well as um, just some specific stories to share with you of, of animals that have gone through the experience of coming through a wildlife center. Um, and then um, we also have our virtual um, adoption event over here, November 20th. Uh, which is on Facebook Live. We have a Humane at Home series that we do every Friday at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live and November 20th is our virtual adoption event. So those are just some fun ways to continue, continue your involvement with the San Diego Humane Society and with um, our adult program series. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to Juliet and she will lead you through a wonderful experience this evening. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you again for coming out and joining us today. Um, I do want to pick up on something that Amelia was talking about with regards to the disaster preparedness talk that's going to be happening. In case you have not heard or gotten the emails about it, we also offer a class for preparing for emergencies with your pets. It's called Excellent in Emergencies. It's for dogs and cats. And it's a six week class on how to train your pets with the behaviors you might need to help them be successful in emergency situations, whether it's going into a carrier, 
grabbing their collars, anything like that, <clears throat> excuse me, working on a solid recall or a common call behavior. It's a really, really, really powerful class um, with a lot of phenomenal content that starts December 5th, which is a Saturday at 8.30 in the morning. So um, that is posted online. It should be live. So if you are interested in following up on that talk, that is a wonderful resource to use to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our main topic for tonight, which is going to be enrichment for our pets. All right, can you all see my screen correctly here? All right, perfect. Let me go ahead and minimize our videos here so it doesn't show up on the recording later. So, all right, once again, hello, my name is Juliet. I'm the Community Training Coordinator for San Diego Humane Society. That means it is my pleasure to organize all of our public dog and cat training classes. And if you've ever joined us for our weekend puppy or kitten socialization ses sessions, you've already met me, um, or if you've done one of our cat training classes. So our topic today is one that is very near and dear to my heart, which is enrichment. And enrichment, in my opinion, is the perfect co-pilot for any training you're doing with your pets. And it makes it much easier, much more accessible, and it helps your pet be, well, a lot more successful in what they're doing. So that said, oh, my PowerPoint is going slow. There we are. What is enrichment? The Association of Shelter Veterinarians defines enrichment as a process for improving the environment and behavioral care of confined animals within the context of their behavioral needs. So we're going to use the term confined to describe any animal living in a human controlled environment. The purpose of enrichment is to reduce stress and improve well being by providing physical and mental stimulation encouraging species typical behaviors like chewing for dogs and rodents or scratching for cats and allowing animals more control over their environment. In a nutshell, enrichment makes everyday life more interesting and the fun type of challenging for your pet. Aside from involving highly rewarding activities that burn mental and often physical energy, enrichment can be a powerful tool for behavior management and modification. And while many forms of enrichment involve food rewards, food isn't a requirement for enrichment to occur. So one of the biggest questions that we get asked is what makes enrichment different from other activities our pet is involved with, such as play? So enrichment can be play, but play isn't always enrichment, which may seem a little confusing at first, but the difference is actually pretty simple. So play, whether by themselves or with other individuals, pet or human, is something our pet enjoys participating in. The behaviors involved are not related to survival and are often very straightforward, like catching a ball um, or a frisbee, digging, going for a swim, playing tug, chewing on squeaky toys or bully sticks or something like that. They're just things our pet enjoys. Similarly, enrichment also describes activities our pet enjoys and wants to participate in, but these activities take a bit more work and are related to instinct or other natural behavior and they require your pet to think and problem solve in the process. So for example, instead of just digging for the enjoyment of digging, your pet can dig for buried treats and now has to use their nose to locate those treats, which mimics natural foraging for food behavior. Cats can also be given puzzles in which to hunt for their food, such as treats or toys in a box they need to dig out with their paws. So let's look at a few examples of enrichment. So there are a lot of different types of activities and honestly, seemingly endless options for modifications, challenges, and creativity when it comes to enrichment. We're going to focus on four main categories of enrichment in our talk tonight, and those will be scent and nose work, agility and sporting, puzzles and feeding enrichment, and then novel experiences. So let's start with scent work. So did you know that humans have around 5 million scent receptors? That probably sounds impressive, but hold on to your leashes, guys. Our dogs have up to 300 million, which is crazy. They can smell the world thousands of times better than we can. So because of this, simply giving your dog time during their walk to kind of, you know, enjoy the walk and sniff things around to their heart's content, that is a very simple, very passive form of enrichment. Think of when your dog, or think of your dog sniffing as a computer that's downloading and processing information. <clears throat> In this case, that information is smells. This teaches them so 
much about their environment. It's more information than we can even begin to imagine. They're learning about who's been where, <clears throat> what types of animals, what types of people. They're, they're learning so much information about what's going on in the environment that they're in. So it's a super great way of giving them a lot of work to do in a way that really doesn't take much effort on our part. It can also help make them more comfortable <clears throat> and confident in their environment. Now, of course, you can also teach your dog to do directed scent work. And canine nose work is a really fun skill your dog can learn and they can compete with it as well. So while we may think of scent work as being um, a very challenging behavior, or we think of scent hounds as being the most naturally adept at this type of enrichment, dogs of all breeds, ages, abilities, and training can enjoy scent work. And, and they don't need any formal training to get started, which I always thought they did. They don't. A dog who doesn't even know how to sit um, you know, consistently can do scent work. So here's a really neat example of a dog searching for containers to find the one holding the scent or odor he's looking for. And this dog, Indy, is um, working with our nose work instructor, Jamie Bozy, and he is a master uh, title holder in the U.S. for mixed breed dogs. So he's finding the scent inside that closed box there, that closed container. So at home, scent work involves many activities that work both outdoors or indoors, such as having them dig through a dog sandbox um, for hidden toys or cookie style dog treats, sniffing scavenger hunts to find their treats or their dinner. And one of my favorites is ball pits. This is great for dogs or for cats. It allows a lot of creativity and flexibility. And um, by giving your pet their meals in a ball pit, it helps you manage their behavior during cooking or meal times if they're underfoot or they like to beg. And because you can use their everyday dry food for this, you aren't overfeeding. You're also having your pet eat more slowly, which for some dogs especially is a really important thing to kind of keep track of. And these activities can take your pet just a couple minutes to upwards of 20 minutes, depending on how challenging you make this behavior. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple examples. This is my cat Ginny digging through her ball pit and all three of my cats will sit by the ball pits and wait every day for us to put treats in them. They love these activities. So these animals will use their noses, they'll use their paws, but they're really just look at, looking for that scent and, and using their minds to do these activities. It's a great way to burn energy and end up with more relaxed and calm pets. So let's go ahead and dive into agility and sporting. These are of course another form of enrichment and they are wonderful, especially for high energy working dogs, though any breed can enjoy it. I once had a couple bulldogs go through an agility class. While sporting does burn a lot of physical energy, you might be surprised how mentally stimulating it is as well. Especially for adult dogs, the new textures of the associated equipment, like of the vinyl and nylon tunnels, um, wobbly rubber discs, the teeter tollers, etc. All of those can be a challenge of their own if they've never experienced anything like that before. So building up confidence and resilience to these, these objects, as well as the way they move or sound, is a really important part of that training. And then of course, there's the obstacles themselves, crawling or running through a small enclosed space like a tunnel, jumping over bars or through a hoop, weaving between poles, again, balancing on a teeter-totter. All of these things require your dog learns a lot about body awareness, such as how to move their back feet up and out of the way when going over a jump. It's actually quite funny when you realize your dog is not aware their back feet can move independently from their front feet and they have to learn that. They also have to pay close attention to their owner's spoken and visual cues and their body language while doing these exercises. So it really requires a lot of focus and a lot of work. Let's check out a couple examples. So here's Indy again, and he's going to show us what hind end awareness looks like. Um, there are some dog sports like dog yoga or AKC fit dog, where body awareness is the primary goal. And that's what you're going to see an example of here. So let's watch him. He's, his goal is to keep his hind legs up on that target platform. So I'm not marking, I'm using my treat delivery as my marker. So 
he's got a lot of hind end awareness, this guy. So he did a pretty great job there. So the next category that we're going to discuss is um, puzzles and feeding. And this is perhaps the broadest category of enrichment because there are just endless options and ideas that can make these just super accessible no matter what type of pet you have. Again, their age, ability, or agility. So you can start with something as simple as scatter feeding, which is where you literally scatter your pet's food on a hard surface as opposed to feeding in a bowl. And that's a great way to build your way up to complex scavenger hunts, which we'll take a deeper look at in just a moment. Um, you can also start by putting loose kibbles and treats into a Kong and working your way up to layers of treats. For example, using kibbles and peanut butter, more kibble and then pumpkin puree. And you can make it even more challenging by freezing it. So lots of ways to be creative here. Additionally, many puzzle-based enrichment activities involve learning new skills, such as here where my cat Ginny uses her head to roll around the empty creamer bottle with the kibble inside. So she'll actually do this for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. And this is just her everyday food. Now we have three cats and we have a gravity feeder available for them at all times. So even though she can go get that same food anytime she wants to, she loves going up to this toy and doing this work. If we're sitting down and reading or watching a show, she'll come and be near us. And instead of begging for treats, she just keeps herself busy by working on that enrichment item. It's a really great way of getting your pet to work for their food and keep themselves busy. Now the concept of preferring to work for food, even when your food is readily available, is called contra freeloading. And this has been observed in a number of animal species, both in our homes, at zoos, and in the wild. There are some really fun videos on YouTube of squirrels doing contra freeloading. Um, so it's pretty neat how we see this concept is just across different species. And what it tells us is that animals see enrichment as an experience worth working for. So speaking of doing some work, let's check out some really cool examples of puzzle enrichment. Now, one of the most valuable aspects of providing puzzle style enrichment is it results in our pets using critical thinking skills to solve problems, such as realizing using a paw is a more effective way of getting food than by pushing with their nose, or that one end of a toy is easier to get treats from than the other. Additionally, this means that many um, of the activities that our pet will learn will result in them, or, oh my gosh, many of the activities that our pets will do result in them learning new mechanical skills that can be applied to other types of training. For example, service dog work. So we're gonna watch um, a couple pups here named Penny and Copper as they demonstrate a variety of really neat skills. Did it come out, Copper? That wasn't fair. <laughs> Pretty awesome, right? So if you watch them, they pushed, they pulled, they twisted things, they pressed on things, they dug, and they spun. They used a combination of their noses, their mouths, and their paws. So let's take a closer look at some of the activities and the skills required for them to do this. You'll also get a good sneak peek at how to maybe build some of these things yourself. And some of these, as you can see, are store-bought, some are homemade.
I love those two. They are great. All right. So like some other types of enrichment, puzzles can also involve being aware of how our dogs are using their bodies. It has them relying on nose work, building confidence with new objects, and it also provides low impact exercise and again can slow down fast eaters. Oh, sounds like some folks are unmuted. Go ahead and just check your um, microphones real quick for me. Thank you, thank you. What? My Chris? Yeah. 15? Amelia, can you go ahead and mute everyone real quick? This is the 17th. Yeah. Is there anything on the 18th? No. Okay. Um, Okay, now we can hear me again. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's keep going. There are several other types of long lasting enrichment that are great for pets of all ages, such as scavenger hunts. Scavenger hunts can start with some simple scatter feeding like we mentioned before, simply scattering your pet's food on a hard surface like a tile or linoleum floor and getting them interested in the game of searching for their food. Then you would expand the search area, starting by placing a few kibbles together in places your pet likes to spend time, like their beds or cat trees, around some of their toys, etc. From there, you could expand the search area and then start decreasing the number of kibble in each location, making them work a little bit harder to find um, the objects that they're looking for. Okay. So, nope, I lost my place here. So this will allow you to build value in your pet being in some of the areas of your home or interacting with objects in your home in specific ways, while also allowing you to show them that some areas are lower value and spending less and spending time there is less worthwhile. So for example, if you didn't want your cat approaching your house plants, you would never do any of their scatter, scatter feeding or scavenger hunts around the house plants. Therefore, there isn't really much value in going to check out the house plants. So you can kind of build um, habits of where your pet tends to go or tends to explore or look for activities to do by using your scavenger hunts in that manner. Additionally, scavenger hunts are a great way to introduce low impact exercise to your pet's routines and can be a really safe and healthy way to help them maintain um, an appropriate or healthy weight. So we're going to go ahead and check out some of our um, other pets doing some Scavenger hunts, here we go. All right, so step number one, you guys saw the screen switch, correct? I'm gonna hope that's a yes. So you should be seeing YouTube now. So let's go ahead and we're gonna watch some scavenger hunting cats. And step one was to put your cats into a quiet room like a bathroom or a bedroom with a couple treats. You then hide their, their regular food in various places. And these cats are pros. So they're looking for one kibble at a time. This will be much more challenging than you might start with your cats. Now a quick tip, they are putting those kibbles by sockets, but your cat's going to be so focused on the kibble, they're not going to stop to play with the socket. If you don't feel comfortable doing things like that, obviously don't. You can see where the exercise comes in there, making the cat climb all the way up the cat tree. Bit of a challenge back there behind the box. I love this. This is similar to a snuffle mat, which you'll see pictures of later. All right, so you hide a whole bunch of treats around. And then when you're ready, looks like he's putting some treats and some puzzle toys. You let the cats out and drop some kibbles on the ground in a scatter feeding sort of style to get them on the hunt, to get them searching for food on the ground. And once you've dropped a few of those kibbles, <laughs> You're going to see these guys start to broaden their search area and go looking around for their kibbles in other places. And you can see they've done this before. They know exactly where to start looking based on previous history. They're also using their noses and hunting for those uh, kibbles. And I will send you a link to the full video of this so you can enjoy it. It's quite a lot of fun. Just so you can see. Here's the cats interacting with one of those puzzle toys. This is from Kong. So you're probably familiar with Kong with dog toys, but you can also use them for cats. 
So again, using their paws, using their heads to push that box out of the way. Lots of great challenges here for these guys. And as you can see, they're having a lot of fun doing it. And you can see how this might take your cat quite a bit of time and quite a bit of work. And you can do this with your dogs as well. All right. Another great thing that you can do with your pets is you can freeze their meals. Now, freezing their meals um, or other food stuff toys is a great way to, again, keep them busy for longer periods and it also helps them stay cool during warmer weather. This is also really helpful if you have a pet who's teething or if you have a pet whose mobility might be restricted due to illness or injury. It keeps them busy and mentally active while also keeping them more sedentary. So if your puppy just got spayed or neutered, or if you have an older dog who suffers from arthritis but still has lots of energy, these are some great ways to keep them busy and active and engaged without being physically active. So it can be a really wonderful tool for some of those situations. And we're gonna move on to our last category, which is novel experiences. Gosh, you guys, enrichment teaches our pets so much and in so many ways. And when you present novel experiences and new activities at different challenge levels that are appropriate for your pet, their success at doing the task and solving the puzzle builds confidence. Interaction with novel objects and experiences builds value in being curious and open to changes in their environments, routines, and their training. Because enrichment can help your dog be comfortable with new experiences, it means they're more likely to be resilient to the unexpected whether it's something big like moving to a new home or traveling or something smaller like interactions with a person with potentially unfamiliar mobility, such as crutches, a wheelchair, et cetera. It could even be getting comfortable with unfamiliar sounds like construction or events like a parade. Enrichment also engages, as you probably have figured out, our dog's minds and keeps them really busy. So having a variety of boredom buster activities for your pet throughout the day, throughout the week, helps keep them out of trouble. So we're going to dive into that a little bit deeper because that's a big bonus of enrichment. Enrichment can be used as part of a behavior modification plan for your pet, whether it's a cat, a dog, or something else. So a great example is does your cat or does your pet rather get the zoomies? My, my cat often does, which is why they always come to mind. The zoomies, if you're unfamiliar, are a big burst of energy that has them either chewing or jumping on everything in sight, possibly including you, racing around doing an uncontrolled version of pet parkour in your living room, which is usually what my kitten is doing. And oftentimes we'll notice it happens at the same time of day or after they've woken up from a nap or there's, there tends to be some consistency to it. If you notice that, try and beat them to it. Give them some enrichment to do in the hour or so leading up to that zoomy window and see if that lessens the intensity or maybe if you don't even get zoomies, maybe you just have a pet looking for a bit of extra play or some training so it's not quite as intense. Um, another kind of way to use this is imagine you have a cat who's jumping up on your table while you're cooking or eating and instead of making it a game by shooing them away so they can jump up again, instead give them a puzzle or a ball pit to do um, that's filled with their dinner that way, while you are busy, they can be busy as well. And that's gonna keep them out of those spaces, out from being underfoot or on top of the table. And it really helps give them something better to do that's still very reinforcing. So enrichment's also great if you have a situation where one pet in your home has higher energy levels or more play drive than another. Um, providing enrichment or dedicated high energy play prior to giving them opportunities to interact sets them up for calmer and potentially more successful interactions. So in our home, we did this with two of our three cats. Our kitten wants nothing more than to be best friends with our 15-year-old cat who does not quite agree with his assessment that they will be best friends. So to help their interactions, we make sure that our kitten gets high energy play um, in the mornings and the evenings when he's most likely to be crazy. And we also work in enrichment throughout the day. And as a result, his interactions with our other two cats are calmer, they're more appropriate, and their relationships have all improved. So what about other natural behaviors like digging and hunting? Again, sandboxes for dogs we mentioned earlier. They're great for digging, um, for treats or toys in. Again, going back to those scavenger hunts can help with those more natural urges to hunt and seek and forage for their food. And cats have a natural cycle of either hunting or playing, followed by eating, grooming, and sleeping. So what that means is you can set up um, your high energy play sessions and feeding times for a time of day when you want your cat to settle down for a long nap shortly afterwards. It's a nice little life hack, I suppose, for living with cats. Similarly, 
it can be useful for any pet to introduce high energy play or um, enrichment before you leave the home, sit down for a meeting or are otherwise going to be busy and unable to interact with them. Because enrichment activities require a lot of work, tend to result in, I mean, they tend to result in sleepy or more mellow pets. This can be really beneficial in those circumstances. Now, it may not be enough to take the edge off of extreme behavioral concerns, but it can definitely help with more mild behaviors. Enrichment also helps encourage healthy behavior patterns in our pets. So what do unhealthy behavior patterns look like and, and why might they occur? So you might see repetitive behaviors such as pacing, repetitive movements around the home or self-harm. Self-harm like chewing and things like that can actually become a coping mechanism for some animals, which sounds strange, but it, it can happen. You may also see frustrated behaviors occur, such as attention-seeking behaviors that may escalate in intensity over time, destruction in the home, or other behaviors that you might describe as acting out. And unhealthy behavior like this can occur for both medical or behavioral reasons. If your vet has ruled out any medical causes for these behaviors, then adding enrichment may be a successful way of interrupting these behavior patterns along with management and training. So I mentioned earlier that enrichment is a really powerful co-pilot. It is, especially um, in some situations like this, it can really make a big difference. Because you can integrate enrichment into the environment and, and in the routine in so many different ways, as we've talked about, there are a variety of opportunities to set your pet up for success. That's a really cool thing to think about. So what are some easy enrichment projects that you can start introducing today without even having to leave your home, which is, let's face it, a little bit harder these days. So believe it or not, you probably already have a lot of these materials at home that you can use to make pet safe enrichment items. Old towels are great for digging in. Paper towel rolls can be filled with treats and the ends can be pinched shut, or they can be cut up and used in puzzles like the one that you see in the top left. And those can be appropriate for cats or small dogs. Egg crates require them using their noses and paws to get treats out of the crevices. Boxes are an entire category all by themselves. They can be folded shut so your pet has to open them. They can be sealed shut with tape or something and then have cutouts put into them that you're, you know, they can stick their paws into. You can use them as bases for other items. You can build them into cat forts or obstacle courses and mazes. There are so many ideas. Um, newspapers can be dug through in various ways. Empty plastic bottles can have the caps removed. It can be filled with kibble or treats and spun around like you see in the other two pictures. Or you can put holes in the sides and roll them around like you saw Janine doing earlier. And as we talked about before, you can freeze um, their meals or treats into a container and then dump it out for them. I like things that are shaped kind of like a pie dish with those kind of angled sides. That makes it easier to get the item out. So let's look at some fun feeder games for full meals. We're going to go from the left to the right and the top down. So number one, your ball pit can start as treats in a box, just an empty box. Um, a really helpful tip for us has been to seal the bottom of the box with durable tape so treats don't get trapped under the flaps, and at least for the beginners, it's harder for them to get that out. After that, once they've gotten the idea of treats in a box, you can add a couple crumpled up newspaper balls and a handful of kibble that your pet can easily see and find. Once they've figured out that game, increase how many balls you have in there and the challenge of finding them. Now in the middle roll, we've stepped things up stepped things up to more intermediate or expert level challenges, where now inside one of those paper balls or several of those paper balls, you actually put a handful or so of kibble. So it's actually open up that paper to find all those treats. Now, if your pet is likely to eat paper, you could also put towels in the box or you can use a container that isn't even cardboard. You can use plastic containers, whatever you'd like, but you can put whatever you want in the box for them to dig through. Um, as long as it's pet safe. You can be super, super creative depending on your pet's needs and their um, you know, likelihood of destruction, I suppose we can say. Now on the last row on the right, this is a really simple and fun game that again, cats, dogs, rabbits, they'll all enjoy doing stuff like this. It's really simple. You just take a towel and you roll up a whole bunch of treats and your pet has to unroll it using their paws or their nose to get all those treats out again. So again, a really fun way of feeding their meals and pretty straightforward and simple with stuff you probably already have at home. Let's look at a couple more examples. So another fun enrichment item that can be made or purchased is called a snuffle mat. Those are on the left there. Snuffle mats are created by cutting long strips of fleece and tying them in lots and lots of knots into a rubber kitchen or bar mat that you can use to create a great nose work activity for either meals or treats. 
And again, they keep your pet working for longer periods of time, nice and quietly and nice and calmly. The other nice thing about a snuffle mat is it's contained. So if scatter feeding is difficult in your home because you have more carpeting, a, a snuffle mat's a great way to keep that food contained in one spot while still making it a nice challenge for your pet. It's also a great way to keep them busy if you need them next to you or staying in one specific area. So for example, if you were to go out somewhere with your pet, you could bring a small snuffle mat and have them do some work while you're having your coffee. Um, another easy to do or easy to purchase item is to either make or purchase a multi-sectioned dish and just put different treats in there for your pet. Um, in the image we have here, we have our cat's regular wet and dry food. And I put a couple little squirts of whipped cream in there and some freeze dried fish that they have for some treats. But you can either feed that fresh or you can freeze it and give it to them frozen. The whipped cream, obviously you can't really freeze, but the other stuff you can, and it can be a lot of fun for your cats. Our cat Kitty is enjoying it right there. And by the way, if you are giving whipped cream to your pets, both cats and dogs love whipped cream, but make sure that you're using the regular whipped cream, not the sugar-free. The sugar-free whipped cream has xylitol in it, which is toxic for our pets. Now, it's really important to remember that enrichment isn't just for our dogs and cats. Any animal can benefit from it. And in fact, many of the activities we've discussed today for our dogs and cats can be modified for small animals or other pets. Because enrichment is a mentally stimulating activity, it can keep small animals from the boredom and frustrated behaviors that we sometimes see, such as destructive chewing, screaming in birds, um, unhealthy or repetitive behavior patterns, over grooming, and so much more. They enjoy enrichment just as much as anyone else. And hopefully after seeing these two videos, you will completely understand what I mean. Fun. This was sent in by one of our volunteers, I believe. video makes me so happy. One more. Look at Benny. So you can see there, she was using her paws, her nose, kind of pushing around using her whole body. And there were treats and um, pellets in there for her to pull out as well. There was hay also, but it had already been removed. So enrichment is natural. And this is especially true for small mammals and birds. Much of their day and their time is spent foraging for food, you know, flying around, searching for it, going through um, different types of seed pods and opening them up. Enrichment is such a huge part of what they do. By providing a variety of foods through foraging-based enrichment, you can stimulate their brain, provide healthy exercises, um, and uh, help encourage other healthy behavior patterns as well. And this is a great concept, a great spin on the ball pit, basically, that we're seeing here on the right. They have a tray filled with, with little small rocks and you know wooden toys and things like that. And there's seeds and uh, nuts and different treats mixed in there for the birds to find. And this is a super, super natural foraging behavior that you would see birds in the wild doing as well. So wonderful, wonderful tip for our bird owners. So I'm sure that by now you're ready to dive into creating some enrichment opportunities for your pets, which is awesome. If you find yourself looking for additional resources, here are some great places to start. So sdhumane.org, we are always adding new resources to our website in the form of articles, videos, webinars, and enrichment focused classes. We have dog sport classes and nose work classes um, trained by Jamie, who you saw here in a couple of the videos. And they are so much fun for dogs of all different ages. We actually have a puppy specific nose work class um, and all the 
all the dog sport activities are designed to be done in your living room with stuff you have at home. So don't let quarantine hold you back. Additionally, you can join a Facebook group dedicated to enrichment and don't let the species names fool you. The canine enrichment group has over 330,000 members from across the world. And it's not just dog owners, it's cat owners, it's small animal owners, it's zookeepers. You'll see videos for all sorts of animals. Um, I saw a wombat enrichment video a couple days ago and there were there was actually a bat video right around Halloween that was super cool. So there's tons of cool stuff in there. There's also a feline enrichment group. And both of these groups use positive reinforcement techniques, which is super, super important, important as well. The canine enrichment group, in case you aren't on Facebook, is public. So you don't have to be on Facebook to access all the content. Just do a Google search for it, you'll find it. You can access all the postings that are in there and you will never <laughs> run out of ideas. And of course, YouTube is a great place to look for do-it-yourself videos on how to build snuffle mats, stuff a Kong, again, so like your scavenger hunts like we saw. There are so many cool resources out there. And if you're struggling to find enrichment that works for your pet or connects with them in some way, or you're unsure how to potentially use enrichment to address different types of behaviors, you can always reach out to your local Humane Society for help, whether that's us or someone that's local to your community if you're from out of town. Now, some of the behavior societies, <laughs> some of the Humane Societies have dedicated behavior helplines that can provide support and guidance. So you are always welcome to reach out. And our helpline is open, whether you're in San Diego or not, you can always reach out to us and we would be happy to help you find some wonderful enrichment resources or other support for the pets in your home. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me this evening for our chat on enrichment. And I would be delighted to take any questions that you have. Um, Juliet, we did have one question um, about what other types of materials you can use in a ball pit. Yeah, so it really depends on the pet. So you can, again, use towels, like I suggested. Um, one of the cool ones that you can do that involves a bit more scent work is go outside and go on a scavenger hunt of your own and find like larger rocks or large pine cones or pet safe plant material, like big leaves and stuff like that. Um, make sure your pet isn't going to eat any of these items. Be monitoring your pet when you're doing this, but giving them a box of stuff to sniff through is a lot of fun. It's a great way to expose them to new things and you can bury treats in there or not, totally up to you. Um, I see a question in the chat that says, is newspaper print safe for dogs? I mean, again, they shouldn't be eating it. It's paper, it's gonna pass through, but I wouldn't let them eat large amounts of paper if you could avoid it because it's not gonna be great for anyone's tummies. Um, but I don't know specifically, personally, of anything that says it isn't. Um, I use magazine pages for my pets, but my cats also aren't eating a lot of paper. So that would, I would, if you have questions, check with the vet. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's all sorts of stuff you can use. You can also use their toys. Um, that might be a good option as well. So whatever your pet might enjoy digging through. When it comes to outdoor ball pits or sandboxes, um, I typically prefer sand as opposed to dirt or mulch if your pet doesn't eat mulch because dirt's a lot less fun to clean off your pet. Um, sand usually wipes off a little bit easier. You can get playground sand from Home Depot in like a 20 pound bag, I think. So it's pretty easy to access it. You don't have to go raid the beaches. Any other questions? Juliet, do you see the one about rabbits? What uh, materials are safe to hide food in for rabbits? <laughs> Depends on your bunny. Um, my bunny likes to eat a lot of fabric. So we always monitored her. We would do a lot of like treats hidden in towels and sheets and she would dig through it and find them. But I would usually do that monitored um, because if she got in the mood, she would just start sitting there and munching on the blankets. But what she really loved was the willow ball that you saw in that video there. Um, Usually she would destroy those pretty quickly, but we gave her one and the next morning it just had that one good hole in it. And I was like, I'm gonna stuff this with food and she see what she does. And she loved it. She made that wiggle ball last for three weeks, almost a month before it had been taken apart too much for her to keep using it. So that was a great resource for her. Now I know some rabbits will eat um, the wiggle balls a bit too quickly and, or eat too much of it and can potentially harm their stomachs. So again, know your pet, pick what's safest for your pet. Um, mine would just shred it and take it to pieces. So again, it really depends on, on your critter. But yeah, play with it and see, see kind of what they like. Again, having them dig through towels or snuffle mats would work for a bunny really nicely. Um, again, you can just have them dig through a box. Mine 
didn't typically eat too much paper. So if we had had her and we still were doing ball pits for the cats, I'm betting she would have loved the ball pit. She loved going through the cat tunnels. You could always scatter food in the cat tunnel and they would like run through that. There's so many different things you can do. So play with different things with your bunny and kind of see what they go for. And everyone can unmute themselves at this point. If you, if you yes. ask a question, you can do that or you can put it in the chat. So it's up to you. I had a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, when you say freeze the food, what if it's like um, canned tuna for my cat, for example, or chicken canned for my dog? Would I freeze that and would they eat it frozen and like chew on it like a popsicle? <laughs> so it's always going to depend on the pet, what their personal preferences are in regard to cold. I don't do as much frozen stuff with my cats as I would with dogs. But that said, I first learned about frozen treats when I was working with the Audubon Society back east and we had river otters. And on warm days, we would freeze our food overnight. We would take all of their, um, they had a mix of dry kibble and basically wet food and some veggies. We would put it into a pie tin, add just enough water to cover it about half to two thirds of the way and then freeze it. And they would get like a large hockey puck in the mornings and they loved it. They would lay there on their backs like chewing on their hockey pucks for hours. Um, they went crazy for it. So it really depends again on the animal with their personal preferences regarding frozen things, but dogs consistently seem to enjoy it as do other animals. Um, I actually don't know if it made it into this. I, I missed it when I was looking at my slides, but there's a, let me check real quick. Do you have to add water, Juliet, to yes. freeze food? Okay. For a lot of things you do need to add water. You guys may have noticed on the, not just for dogs and cats one, there was a turtle eating a big frozen salad. So add a bit of water to freeze it, even with the canned foods like that, and you should be fine. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have to say, Juliet, thank you so much with the puppy socialization thing. You're welcome. Because Barley, I don't, don't know if you remember Barley and Iris and the I whole do. issue we had with that, but they are happily integrated. They play, I know, I was they play, they get along. Nobody's trying to kill each other anymore. So we're so happy. I'm so glad <laughs> so to hear it, JJ. It's great so to you. see you again. Yay. Juliet, there was a question about the frozen food. Um, can it make a big mess? And do you have any recommendations for that? If it does, I imagine the water melting. Potentially it can. Um, the first time or two that you do frozen treats like that, maybe monitor your pet. Um, see how quickly they're going through it. If they are not chewing on it consistently, then I would either go for smaller ones or I would use a bit less water or I would do it in a place where it's easier to clean the flooring. Mm -hmm. So maybe like baby gate them into the kitchen or something. Um, another great idea is muffin tins. Using a muffin tin and freezing things in the muffin tin, it's kind of like it out of the tin, keeps it a bit more contained and it's also smaller portions. So that's a great option as well. They don't have to be big dishes. They can be small dishes. You can take it out of the dish or you can keep it in the dish. Um, again, there's a lot of flexibility with what you're able to do. And it shouldn't make too much of a mess. It, again, really just depends how much water you add. <clears throat> so I'm inclined to use things that are either already kind of like softer, like wet food with a bit of water, or um, again, just not using so much water that it will be such a pain to clean up if they aren't going for it like crazy. But usually they're pretty good at clean up crewing themselves if they're interested in what you have in there. Let me see. Yeah, some great articles on Chewy.com and interactive toys on there. It's not, or not maybe articles, sorry, interactive toys. Yeah, there's some great tips in the chat. Okay, yeah, so Elizabeth is saying that her cats like ice cubes to be tossed down. So some cats will definitely go for frozen things. Um, one of our cats is missing most of his teeth. So we don't, we don't do a lot of frozen things for him. Mm. Any other questions? All right, well, I guess if you think of questions, you guys can um, respond to my email. You're welcome to do that. Um, and I can forward them on um, for a follow-up. So feel free to do that if you think of something. Um, so thank you everybody for attending and um, we will be sending out this recording along with the slides and some resources as well from Juliet. Yes, we will. All right, well, thank you all. Have a great evening. And if you have questions, I'll go ahead and hang out for a minute. Feel free to keep asking. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
Let me go ahead and stop our recording for you. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Yeah.